I won't mince words. Jack 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. Now, it's not in the top 5, it's more like number 10 in the top 10, but it still gets a spot in the list without question. I bring this up at the forefront of the video because I want to make my stance on this game clear before we even begin. Jack 2 is a divisive game. Some love it, some hate it, some just think the Jack series past the first game is not worth a second thought, and I'm obviously in the first camp of people. And so I want to spend this video explaining why I think this game is so memorable and comes together so well in the end despite the issues that it does indeed have. This review of Jack 2 follows up upon my review of Jack 1 from last week, so if you missed that, I definitely think you should check it out first. I'll do my best to make sure you're up to speed if you only want to hear about Jack 2 though. I also opened the video this way because I wanted to make sure I spent the first 30 seconds talking about Jack and Daxter because this video is about to spend the next few moments talking about a lot of things that may seem unrelated to Jack and Daxter, but that's because the history and context of this one is very important. I mean, we're looking at a series that went from this to this in one entry. How did this happen? Well, let's look at it. The story of why Jack 2 is the way it is is heavily tied to a game that came out the same holiday season as Jack 1, and that game is Grand Theft Auto 3. Believe me, this will make sense in a few minutes. This game more or less changed the video game industry overnight. From a design standpoint, this game had taken the open world feel from the first two GTA games on PS1, but evolved it into being full 3D, adding an extra layer of immersion. I'm not going to say this game invented the sandbox genre, but needless to say, if you play any game today, or really any game in the last 20 years that involved you running around a large open world with tasks and objectives marked on a mini-map or with waypoints, that game was influenced by Grand Theft Auto 3 in some way. But more importantly, GTA 3 changed the video game industry in a cultural sense. This game generated a large source of controversy back when it was released in 2001. Playing as an escaped convict doing various amounts of criminal activity just sparked a discussion about what was acceptable in video games. This debate ranged from video game websites rating it the most offensive game of 2001 to full-on news stations discussing the violent and sexual material depicted within the game. Now, the game was rated M, meaning players 17 and up could play it, but the discussion was more about if explicitly playing as the bad guy doing bad things like carjacking and beating innocent people up with a baseball bat and outrunning the law, alongside other things I won't mention to keep this video advertiser friendly, was something that even should be in a mainstream video game. Obviously, video games had controversies before GTA 3. I mean, the ESRB rating system was created in the 90s as a result of increasingly violent games, even if those had more limited graphics compared to what GTA 3 and now games of today had in them. But this one was different. Despite all the controversy caused by Grand Theft Auto 3, it clearly didn't make a change because the PS2 alone got two more GTA games, and then the series continued on to GTA 4 and GTA 5, which they then ported endlessly for the next nine years. But why? Well, GTA 3 was the highest selling game of 2001. First, controversy sells, this much is a fact. The game getting so much media attention only put more spotlight onto it and made more people curious to try it. But more importantly, GTA 3 came out in the early 2000s, which I think is fundamentally the largest demographic shift the gaming industry has ever seen, and then I'd argue will ever see. Now, really strap in, because it may seem like this has nothing to do with Jack, but bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Just by looking at the context of the early 2000s in gaming, you'll see why this demographic shift happened and how it was more or less inevitable. In the 80s and into the 90s, video games were largely considered a children's thing. It still is today, however, seeing a video game console in a home that does not contain children is pretty normal. This is just a mainstream thing for people of all ages and demographics nowadays. More mature games existed in the 90s like Boomer Shooters, Mortal Kombat, and a plethora of rated MPS1 games, but like I said, I think it's fair to say that back in the 80s and 90s, games were more or less considered a children's hobby. That's the audience they were appealing to, after all. But the generation that grew up on the first Nintendo largely didn't stop playing games into their older years. If you were five years old when Super Mario Bros. came out in 1985, then by the release of the PlayStation 2 in 2000, you'd be 20 years old. Maybe during the PS1 era, this demographic thought games like Mario and Crash were cool, but also got enjoyment out of the mature games that were making the rounds as well. But by the release of GTA 3 in 2001, this age group was well into their 20s. These were full adults still playing the newest video games with their own money. A new, large portion of the audience. So as a result, in the early 2000s, the mature games just became the biggest and most popular ones. See GTA 3, MGS2, Halo 1, and the list goes on. But then you might be wondering, what's the problem here? Can't both audiences coexist? Well, they could, and they definitely did, but GTA 3 type games being the most popular game for adults affected all audiences. That's how we circle back to Jack and Daxter. The first game was a technical masterpiece. 
It was one of the most impressive worlds designed in a game at the time of its release. It had wonderful animation, fun gameplay, and a charming story. However, when it was released, the first Jack and Daxter had a hard time finding the right audience, as the industry evolved seemingly overnight and Jack and Daxter was working off the model that made games in the late 90s so successful. On an episode of Dev Plays, where Tim Schafer played video games alongside one of the lead designers on that particular game, Jason Rubin explained this change in the audience better than I ever could, so I'll let him say it. We were we had already started working on Jack 2, mm -hmm. and I remember doing a focus group with, and two eight-year-olds were in this focus mm -hmm. group, and I was like, so what do you think? And they acted like 16-year-olds, like eight-year-olds. Well, oh, the graphics are good, and we really like the gameplay, mm -hmm. we like what you're doing, and the expansion of the universe. Really, this would be a fantastic game for our little brothers. And mm -hmm. you're like, you're eight. What, what are you playing? Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah. And, it told just you, changed everything. Focus so yeah, Naughty Dog, seeing that the kinds of games they had made were just falling out of style, wasn't sure if continuing Jack and Daxter was really something worth doing. So they came to an agreement with Sony that there was still a lot more you could do with Jack and Daxter that hadn't been done. So they radically transformed the identity of Jack and Daxter into something much different. This is where the divisive elements of the game come in. Some feel like the Jack sequels are a transparent attempt to desperately grab the mainstream audience, shining a light on how the precursor legacy was basically doing the same thing just with a different audience. I don't see it that way because like I said at the beginning, Jack 2 is one of my favorite games. And today we're going to be exploring all the things that Jack 2 does to evolve this series and the gaming industry in positive ways and then also gush over why I enjoy it as much as I do. So strap in, this might be a slightly longer video than usual but I think it's worth it because we're talking about Jack 2. For every age, there is a time of trial. The rocks faced such a fire before they were the strength beneath our feet. The plants braved vast winds before their roots could give us life. As a sage of considerable years, I have known only one such great ordeal. Yet the hero it created was a champion for all time. Had to let that full sequence play out. I've always felt like the opening monologue from Samos really got me in gear for an epic story. Much more than the opening monologue from Jack 1. Jack 2 places much more emphasis on story than the previous game. The first game had a little over half an hour's worth of cinematics, but Jack 2 has over 90 minutes of cutscenes telling a much more in-depth story than the first game. Jason Rubin said this when promoting Jack 1, that the gamers want more. For the same exact price, but they want more. So it was time for Naughty Dog, as a studio, to take the plot more seriously. So what are we dealing with here? Well, if you got 100 power cells in Jack 1, then you'd see Jack, Daxter, Kira, and Samos react to opening this giant door that flashed white. If you look at fully completing games as a method of obtaining a cool reward, this is pretty lame, but in my case, I like to complete that game because I find it rewarding intrinsically. But this ending did serve to set up a sequel, and here we are. The group has taken what was inside of the door and somehow lugged it all the way back to Samos' hut. What they found was a giant precursor ring and a rift rider to travel through it. In order to activate it, Jack has to use his special powers to make it work, which caused the rift gate to open as monsters tear through alongside their leader. The group manages to escape by going through the rift, but Jack and Daxter get separated from Kira and Samos, landing in a place completely different from what they're used to. A whole city walled off from the rest of the world called Haven City, patrolled by the Crimson Guard, who seemingly knew Jack was going to be here and captured him as Daxter makes a getaway. Two years later, we see that Jack has been held as a prisoner of Baron Praxis, the dictator ruling Haven City. Praxis and his right-hand man, Errol, have been performing torturous dark eco experiments on Jack as a part of their Dark Warrior program. This allows Jack to tap into the dark eco in his body to transform into a destructive monster called Dark Jack, this also taking away Jack's previous eco powers. The point of the experiment is to give them an edge in their war against the metalheads that threaten to destroy the city, the same monsters that came through the rift at the beginning. After two years of this, Praxis rules the Dark Warrior program as a failure and says to kill Jack later since they aren't getting the results they want. But Daxter miraculously comes to the rescue as we get this moment here that changes the dynamic of the series and sets the stage for Jack 2. I've been looking for you for two years! Say something! Just this once! I'm gonna kill Praxis! <laughs> yeah, Jack can now fully speak. This was a tricky one for the team, because like I said in the last video, Jack was a mute character. He never spoke one word of dialogue throughout the entire game. And that's because they just thought a character with his own personality would distract from the immersion of the game. But other games at the time had characters with their own personalities that weren't annoying or just terribly voice acted, so it was time for a change. Jack now speaks in most of the cutscenes. 
they tried to make it as smooth of a transition as possible. In an earlier version of the story that you can read from the Jack 2 design bible, the original intention was to just have Jack start talking from the very beginning of the game, even though it takes place right after the first game's ending. That would have been jarring to the audience, so I'm glad they changed it to where, at the start of Jack 2, Jack is exactly who he was in the first game. But two years of Dark Eco experiments later, Jack is pissed and ready for action. As Daxter remarks a few times in the early scenes that it's weird for Jack to now talk. But that's just to say to the audience, yeah, Jack talks now, you gotta just go along with it. I think the change was for the better. Jack 1 had funny moments as a result of Daxter being the one who could talk. I'm Daxter. He's Jack. He's with me. Good job, Daxter. But Jack 2 gives the duo back and forth throughout the game, and I find that much more entertaining. Whoa, got it. Where would you be without me, eh, Dax? Well, Jack, I probably wouldn't be two feet tall, fuzzy, and running around in a sewer without a pair of pants. God, I miss pants. Special shout out to Mike Irwin who brought the character of Jack to life. I can't put it any better than Naughty Dog did in the behind the scenes video. You look at the art of Jack in this game and you hear the voice Mike does and it's like, yeah, that's Jack. So, who or what do we have to shake down, knock out, or blow up? All in all, I think the game made the transition between Jack's old personality and his new one as gracefully as they could, but then they just move on once it's established. Back to the story. Jack and Daxter escape Praxis' prison and meet an old man named Kor outside who's protecting a child who is apparently important. Kor tells Jack and Daxter that there's a rebellion being waged against Baron Praxis called the Underground that he helps out and that they should join. The Underground is led by someone called the Shadow, but when they join they only deal with Torn until they prove themselves worthy of meeting the Shadow. So that's the big picture for the first act of the game. Jack and Daxter proving themselves to the underground and meeting various people who live in Haven City, navigating characters with different motivations and tasks that they want you to do as you work your way up the ranks of the underground, hoping to meet the Shadow and get revenge on Baron Praxis for what he's done to Jack, setting up the journey. Now, with all this talk of what's changed regarding Jack 2 coming off the first game, that naturally leads one to wonder how different the actual game is. The answer is, when playing as Jack, Nothing is different. Jack's entire moveset from the Precursor Legacy is still in Jack 2. His punch, spin, uppercut, dive, roll, roll jump, all that. Everything that made Jack fun to play in the first game is still present in Jack 2. And they gave every action a really satisfying sound effect too. Something I noticed when doing all of Jack's moves in rapid succession. Not a big deal, I'm just saying. Genuinely, the only change that I can think of is when jumping out of a dive, Jack will do this spin in the air instead of just jumping back into the air like he did in Jack 1, which is a quality improvement in terms of making every animation seamless. But yeah, despite the game trying to age the series up a bit, the game is still built off the back of things that made Jack 1's animation work, like squash and stretch in your attacks and Daxter's responses to your movements, and those things still work just as well in Jack 2. Jack 1 made advancing the technology in games to another level one of its core elements, and Jack 2 keeps that going. Jack 1 had an option for a cropped 16x9 display, something other 2001 PS2 titles weren't doing. So that game was ahead of the curve on that. But Jack 2 adds to the graphical options by including a toggle for progressive scan, or a 480p resolution. Games running at 480p was a little more common on Nintendo's GameCube and Microsoft's Xbox, but on the PlayStation 2, a vast majority of games were running at 480i, which sees the image on screen flickering due to the way displays draw every frame in 480i, for technical reasons I don't care to explain. Point is, running at 480p produces a cleaner and more defined look that also puts Jack 2 on the small list of games for the PlayStation 2 that did have 480p support. The most impressive technical achievement in Jack 2 is the way the cutscenes are presented, though. This was the first game where Naughty Dog utilized cutscene models. In the gameplay, the models are pretty much the same quality as what you saw in Jack 1. But Jack 1 used those gameplay character models in its cutscenes, where you could see how the models are dated today since you have to look at them up close. Jack 2 uses lower poly models for gameplay, but then made more detailed models for the cutscenes, where you'd be admiring the details of the characters much more. A character model from the Precursor Legacy had about 3,000 polygons, but these cutscene models in Jack 2 will have close to 15,000, giving the characters more detail like in Daxter's fur, Jack's hair, the clothes in the various characters. They just look fantastic. And then in motion, it's even better. Jack 2, even with its significantly higher cutscene count, still put great effort into the animation with fast movement, lots of detail and movements on the screen at once from the various characters, and expressive facial animation. With all these improvements over the first game, I figured I'd also mention that when playing on PS2, there are some technical issues compared to the first one. 
Jack 1 ran at a perfect 60 frames per second, and when a lot of action is going on in Jack 2, the frame rate will dip to a degree where you would notice, even if it's not game breaking. I also found pop in very noticeable during my playthrough, where I'd get close to enemies and just see details appear on their models the closer I got. I also saw cases of visible culling of geometry, which I don't think you ever did in Jack 1, or even Naughty Dog's Crash games on PS1. Much more distracting would be how frequent screen tearing is in this game. It's hard to spot when things are going really fast, however you might notice in cutscenes especially that things might seem jittery, and that's because of screen tearing. If you take any cutscene and look at it frame by frame, you'll notice what I'm saying. A line will just appear on the screen, especially when changing angles from one shot to another. But this also does happen in gameplay. In addition to that, I think the game's way of having no load screens is a little less impressive than Jack 1 when playing it, since in that game you could walk from Samos' hut to Gaul and Maya Citadel without having to wait. In Jack 2, you don't stop and see a screen that says, Now loading! But the game definitely has loading zones, like these passageways between areas that have these big gears on them. The door opens when the game is done loading. Jack 1 used cutscenes for loading like the ride to Misty Island from Sandover Village, I just think that overall Jack 1 disguised loading better than Jack 2, where you'll see a cutscene of you flying away and then cut to black for a few seconds before reaching the next area. As I'm sure you all know by now, I prefer playing my PS2 games on an actual PS2, but after years of having played this game on the 2012 HD collection and then going back to the PS2 release, you see that the loading in these rooms is much faster on PS3 than on PS2, as you'd expect. But then when playing on an original disc, it just makes the loading more apparent to me. Speaking of the HD collection though, that is how most people will experience this game these days, and all these issues from frame drops to screen tearing are not present there. It's only like that on PS2. While it sounds like I'm being negative towards Jack 2's visual presentation, I'm not. I'm just making sure that, in the interest of balance, that I point out the ways the game pushed the graphics forward, but also how it had new obstacles to performance as a result. I said these were technical inferiorities to Jack 1, but that just depends on your point of view. Technically, Jack 1 had a perfect frame rate and didn't see nearly as much pop-in or screen tearing, but that's not because Jack 2 is inferior technologically to Jack 1, that's because Jack 2 was pushing the limits of the PlayStation 2 hardware much more than the last game. More enemies on screen, more NPCs, a larger world. So yeah, maintaining these things without loading screens and doing that while targeting 60 FPS and including these high poly cutscene character models is going to be a lot tougher on the hardware than Jack 1, which didn't do any of that. But then, when you level the playing field between the two on something like the PS3 HD collection, it's pretty obvious that Jack 2 is much more technologically advanced than its predecessor. And what I'm realizing is that we haven't even gotten into the meat of the game yet, and this video is already two-thirds the length of the Jack 1 video. What can I say? Being a big YouTuber sure does make you nitpicky. So having said that, once you're in the world of Jack 2, what do you do? Well, Haven City is where you're stuck for the entire game, and the city is divided into a couple of areas, but these are all blocked with security passes, so at first you only have access to the slums where the underground base is located. You go here and get objectives from Torn. You leave the base and then see the minimap displayed in the lower right, as you follow these icons leading you to important destinations. This much works just like Grand Theft Auto 3, and it's pretty intuitive. By the end of the game, you'll know the map to Haven City pretty well. However, it's great that you have the map at all times that displays these icons, and you just follow them as it takes you on the path to your next objective. But this is just how you get from place to place. The actual destinations make up the core content of Jack 2. Outside the security walls lie dangerous areas like Dead Town, where the Metalhead armies overwhelmed the Crimson Guard to the point of a retreat. The Pumping Station, which is also overrun by Metalheads. The Sewers, the Drill Platform, the Dig, and some others. Each time you visit these locations, you have a mission to do, but then you keep coming back to these areas throughout the game, which might sound repetitive, but you always uncover something new in the process. I'll take the Pumping Station as an example. The first time you go here, you take a right from this platform because it's the only path available to you on your quest to turn the valve on that brings the water back to the slums. But the next time you go here is where you have to protect Sig while he hunts for giant metalheads. Sig uses his ultra-powerful Peacemaker gun to blow open this tank that allows you to go where you couldn't before. Then, the next time you go here, you find a pathway you hadn't taken before to meet Ashlyn, the Baron's daughter who's secretly working with the Underground while she's under attack from the metalheads. All the locations you visit are like this, where it may be the same area, but what you do is completely different each time, and what you see might also be different. It's like how your first mission at the Dig is this jet board challenge where you grind on rails to destroy this giant machine, but then the next time you visit here is a long mission with exploration, combat, and platforming to reach a seal piece you need to progress. 
Playing this game again has only reminded me of the fact that I do believe this is an authentic sequel to the first game from a gameplay perspective. I already mentioned the fact that Jack's entire moveset from the Precursor Legacy is here and accounted for in Jack 2, so from that alone, players of the first game should have an easy time getting into Jack 2. But then when actually playing it, you see the game puts just as much of a focus on tight platforming in its levels as the first game. Areas like Praxis's Palace, The Dig, and Mars Tomb show this off best, where you got time your swinging jumps right and land on moving platforms. So it's just as satisfying as it was in the first game to roll jump off of ledges and high jump off the platform you land on to make it to the next one. And when you're fast enough to get all the moving platform segments done in one cycle without waiting, you feel pretty rad. If anything, I think it might actually be more fun in Jack 2 than the first game, because the platforming segments throughout this game are actually more difficult, on average, than what you'd find in the first game. And more complex, too, as you have more movement options. Like the escape from Praxis's palace at the end of the game. You gotta make these perilous jumps over a bottomless pit while blasting the enemies from afar. And then at this moment, you gotta shoot the glass out of the window to grind along the ledge with your jet board. It's really fun and exciting. It's easy to think Jack 2 is a radical departure from the first game, and in many ways, it obviously is. But I think the core DNA of what the first game was trying to achieve is still in Jack 2. By that, I mean, on the surface, this game was not a colorful collectathon, obviously. But what was Jack 1 trying to do? Well, it wanted to take elements that games from the late 90s had utilized, like the platforming of Super Mario 64, the grand scale and story and mythology of Ocarina of Time or Final Fantasy, and paying attention to the details like Banjo-Kazooie, and combining those elements into something that had all of those things at once that felt fresh just the same, while impressing you with its jaw-dropping visuals and technology. Jack 2 just realized that the elements they were taking weren't what the industry was most impressed by anymore. So they still took their platforming-focused gameplay and thought, how do we adapt this into what's popular? So you have a game that tries to take the open-world mission-based gameplay from Grand Theft Auto and combining that with some creative gunplay and incorporate elements from Tony Hawk into the game for that extra youth appeal and giving it a post-apocalyptic Blade Runner cyberpunk vibe as the backdrop of their more serious story while still playing exactly like Jack 1. It's an interesting mix, but definitely feels like a sequel to Jack 1, just not the one you'd expect. Now, that doesn't mean the implementation of these things is above criticism because mixing popular elements from other games is a staple of the series. Driving in Jack 2 is one of the main areas the game gets flack for. A lot of folks find it boring. Now, I've kind of flip-flopped on this issue over the years. In my earlier playthroughs back in the day, I found driving between missions to be the part where you get to relax from the challenge of the missions. That issue we'll talk about later, don't you worry. But then when I got better at the game, I tended to think that the long commute between areas just took up too much time in my playthrough. Now, I think there's still truth to that. You start in the slums, but then you gain access to this industrial district, a long sequence of passageways that leads to the port at the bottom of the map. You then gain access to the left side of the map where the gardens and the bazaar are located. And at the very top of the map is the stadium that leads to the main town, which is the most developed area, and sees Praxis's palace at the very center, which stands tall above the rest of the city. The map in this game is pretty large. So, when you're in the port at the bottom and your next objective is located at the stadium, that's a pretty long drive. Same for being in the gardens and having to go all the way back to the slums and talk to Torn or whoever. It's just a long commute from area to area since there aren't a lot of shortcuts or easy ways to do it. However, I find the act of driving in Jack 2 fun. Like GTA, you get around by stealing people's cars, but technology has evolved in the Jack world to where the zoomers you rode in Jack 1 are now capable of full flight and have different classes. The basic zoomer is the fastest and the one you'd best grab if you want to move quickly, however, these are pretty vulnerable and blow up easily. Therefore, if your mission is to destroy something on the move, you're best grabbing a heavy vehicle which turns worse and moves slower, but the boost in defense is worth it for these missions. Sometimes you'll find a Crimson Guard bike just sitting around unoccupied, and these are the best moments, because then you feel all the benefits of grabbing that sweet ride, a fast hover bike with a cannon on the front, just without instantly setting the whole city on alert. When piloting these vehicles, you have to switch between the low zone and the hover zone. And I just think it's fun going really fast and weaving in and out of traffic by going high and going low, especially when on the run from the guards. So my overall stance is, at some moments, driving can get old if it goes on for a few minutes, but for most of the game, I find it enjoyable. Even more fun than that is the new jet board. Jack and Daxter get their hands on a hoverboard that you first test out in this skating rink where you have to do combo tricks to get high points. This thing feels great to use, to the point where in this playthrough, when my drive was short enough, I'd even just take the jet board to where I was going because then I'd go mad with the tricks and the grind rails getting from place to place. If you do a perfect 360 spin, you get an instant speed boost and the controller vibrates when you land, which is great feedback. R1 allows you to do basic tricks like spins, but on L1 you can do these crazy combo tricks that grant you more points for comboing them together without touching the ground and just looks really sick. As a Jack 2 vet, using the jet board to get through basic segments gets more enjoyable with each run. 
especially this late game mission in the strip mine that makes you use the jet board to grind on rails. Getting through here without dying and while maintaining the speed from the board is some good fun. But of course, if we're talking about Jack's extra gear, there's one elephant in the room. Zeke! Real Capitan here yeah, and his friend, Bonus. If you want to see what that baby can do, try the gun course outside. Show me some skill with that hardware, and I'll hire you for a job or two, eh? After the fifth mission, Jack and Daxter meet Crew and his right-hand man, Sig. Crew sends the three of them to hunt down some metalheads, but to make sure Jack has the firepower to watch Sig's back, you're granted the Morph Gun. I absolutely love everything about the Morph Gun. In Jack 2, you have access to four weapons. First is the Red Scatter Gun. Shortly after, you get the Yellow Blaster. Then a bit later, you get the Blue Vulcan Barrel. And towards the end of the game, you get the Dark Peacemaker. These are four modes that the Morph Gun switches between. Four modes the player switches between with the four D-pad buttons. The Morph Gun switching between these four settings is one of my favorite animations to look at in the game. Most of the time you won't even see it as the camera is behind Jack, but when you do look at it, it's cool the gun doesn't just click or pop between settings. You can actually see the barrel change shape when switching between the modes as Jack holds each one differently and fires each one differently. It's such a neat way to bring guns into the Jack and Daxter series. You don't play as Jack firing some realistic assault rifle like it's Shadow the Hedgehog from 2005. This is a sci-fi weapon that you want to see up close since it's so original. You also want to see the various animations they gave Jack and Daxter when using it. I do say Daxter because they allow the player to fire guns while driving by having Daxter grab the morph gun from Jack's back while he's the one driving the vehicle. They also made each mode of the morph gun tie back to mechanics from the first game. I mentioned earlier that as a result of Praxis's dark eco experiments on Jack, he no longer has the ability to use eco powers or interact with precursor artifacts like he did in Jack 1. But these guns are all made using the various eco types as ammunition. In Jack 1, Red Eco made your attacks more powerful and allowed you to easily wipe out small groups of close by enemies. The Scatter Gun is a weaponized form of Red Eco that you use to blow enemies back from close range. Yellow Eco allowed Jack to shoot fireballs out of his hand. And so, the Blaster is their basic gun that used to shoot enemies both close and from afar. Blue Eco made Jack run faster, so naturally, the Vulcan Barrel shoots rapidly across the screen and the Peacemaker uses Dark Eco to unload electric destruction all over the screen. These are very basic video game gun archetypes like the shotgun, the rifle, the Gatling gun, and the grenade launcher, but they take these familiar ideas and just give them a Jack and Daxter twist. Jack 2's gunplay is very unconventional, but I love it. When you get the hang of it, there's nothing that plays quite like it. For example, you can't strafe around enemies in Jack 2, but I don't feel like I ever needed it, because they designed weapons that were meant to be used alongside Jack's existing moveset, if you need distance, you roll jump away from the enemies and start shooting them and the generous auto-aim will do the rest. Each weapon just feels really useful throughout the game. Like if you see a crowd of small enemies come rushing your way, you know to bust out the scatter gun and tear them to pieces. If you're in combat with the bigger enemies, you spin, kick, or punch them first and then fire the blaster to do three shots right on them. Something you get taught when you first unlock the weapon. When enemies are firing at you from afar, the Vulcan Barrel will stop them dead in their tracks as you unload your ammo upon them, and then, when surrounded by enemies or a tough boss in the late game, you use the Peacemaker to level the playing field. Not that there's only one use for weapons. As the Blaster is great with distance, it just doesn't have the stun power of the Vulcan Barrel. The Scatter Gun can put some room between you and the bigger enemies as its range is pretty big, but the rate of fire is slower than the Blaster and less precision than the Spin Kick Blaster Maneuver. But all the weapons are viable in most combat situations, but each weapon does shine in its own areas. And for the millionth time, I just love the sound effects. Great, great, great. That's not to say every method of combat in Jack 2 is a hit. One of the main things advertised in this game is Jack's new transformation, Dark Jack, that has been unleashed thanks to the experiments. Defeated enemies will drop Dark Eco that fills up this gauge around your health bar. When it's full, you can press a button to become Dark Jack, but this barely gets used throughout the game. Your melee attacks are more powerful in this mode, but you go flying all over the screen to the point where you can barely control yourself. When activated, you're also stuck with it until the bar is depleted, meaning that if you do use it, you want it to be worth the full bar of Dark Eco, and most situations aren't like that. You can't use any weapons either. This is absolutely something you only use when you're desperate and surrounded by enemies. Otherwise, it's just not that useful. It kind of creates a weird disconnect between the gameplay and the story, since cutscenes say Jack is his vicious dark side from this transformation, but I never use it, so yeah. You do get upgrades for Dark Jack via Metalhead Skull Gems that you give to the Precursor Oracle. 
These are fun to use, like the Dark Bomb that clears enemies, or the Electric Dark Blast that clears boss health bars, but again, it doesn't make the form any more useful compared to your other options. Late in the game, you might get the Invincibility Mode, which speaks for itself, and then finally, there's the Dark Giant, where you can grow double your size and run rampant throughout the city like you're the Hulk or something. But I've never obtained this during the campaign, so it's not very useful to me. I've actually never fully completed this game as a whole. I mean, I've beaten the campaign plenty of times, trust me. But I mean that you can collect precursor orbs like the first game, and Daxter explains these are worth a lot now because they're rarer than they were in Jack 1. I just never bothered collecting them all because I don't see the point. Collecting all the precursor orbs grants you neat extras like being able to rewatch cutscenes, replay missions, and view great concept art. But if I ever want to play Jack 2, I'm just going to play the whole game, not individual missions or cutscenes. And the art's on Google at this point. For 200 Precursor Orbs, you unlock Hero Mode, a harder version of the campaign. Maybe that's worth a live stream one day. We shall see. I've never played it before, and I don't really have the time now. I mean, have you seen how long this video has been thus far? Collecting Precursor Orbs in this game involves searching through the tiniest nooks and crannies of every area, some of which are only accessible once in the campaign, and are otherwise just doing busy work like going through rings or reaching a destination before time runs out. Needless to say, I'm just fine doing the campaign. Although I should note, Hero Mode is unlocked with 200 orbs and there are 286 in the game, so you can miss a few, which is nice. But I'm now wildly off subject from what I was talking about a few moments ago, which was the game's combat. I was saying that it was pretty balanced and fun. I wasn't sure if I should just start out by saying that I thought it was balanced well, because that's not the common consensus. One of the main abilities Jack has with his guns is shooting them while spinning in the air. So many players have adopted this strategy of grabbing the blaster, jumping, spinning, and firing, sending shots all over the screen in the hopes they kill the enemies, believing this to be the dominant strategy of Jack 2. I used to play like this myself, but in more recent years, I stopped doing that as much. Only doing that when I had no health left and needed a quick Hail Mary before I got killed in the hopes I'd survive. But this is a bad strategy to rely on for most of the combat situations in the game. This video by Powercell Zeke explains it pretty well. I'll link it below. When I first watched this video, the things I had been noticing about the game's combat were definitely validated, but I'll quickly sum it up. The jump, spin, shoot strat leaves it up to chance as to whether or not your shots will hit the enemies as they just fly all over the screen in random directions. This drains your ammo like it's nobody's business. When the blaster has much more accuracy just being used normally, and when enemies are firing at you from afar, it's much easier to grab the Vulcan barrel and shoot them, locking them in place before they die. In the metalhead nest at the end of the game, I was attacked by a group of small enemies and some big metalheads that fired lasers. What I did was bust out the scatter gun and kill the little guys with it, and then use the Vulcan barrel to stop the laser guys from firing while I wailed on them. If I just did the jump spin shoot, you can clearly see that I'm hitting the enemies, technically. But you see how much ammo is being wasted on shots that are not hitting anything, draining resources in the hope that I hit my foes with some of these stray shots. It can work, but you'll likely take damage and probably die because that's what happens to a lot of players when playing the game like this. When the true dominant strategy is using all your moves together, like punches and spin kicks on unarmed enemies, the scatter gun on fast-moving tiny enemies, the blaster spin kick move on armed enemies, the Vulcan barrel on enemies from far away, and the peacemaker on bullet sponges or boss fights. So yeah, I really have no issue saying that this game has a pretty balanced combat system when using all your tools together. The jump spin shoot strategy is a large contributor in why many players feel this game is very challenging. Believe me, if you think Jack 2 is a challenging game, I'm not calling you out. This isn't even a new position. The PlayStation Magazine review got flack from readers back in 2003 because of the fact that the author criticized Jack 2 for its difficulty balancing. A full magazine article was written on the top 10 hardest missions in Jack 2. YouTubers have been discussing the difficulty of this game in their videos for well over a decade now. I just said that the jump spin shoot strategy is part of why, but really there are many factors in why this game is considered so difficult that have nothing to do with the player's capability or method of approach. In fact, I used to think this game was insanely difficult. I was right there with you guys spending 30 minutes on get the sealed piece from the slums or the final boss or the various racetrack missions. The game is tough as nails on the first playthrough. Side tangent, I know. But I just want to throw it out there that when I was a kid, I never made real progress in Jack 2 or 3. I just bumbled around causing trouble in the city. Whenever I recount this fact in a video, I then follow it up with, Then later, I tried to beat the game for the first time when I was older, in 2011. But it really dawns on me now that there's a much bigger gap between 2011 and now than Jack 2's release in 2003 and my finally beating it in 2011. There are people older than me who have felt this much more, but I'm just saying, I feel old and that's a new experience for someone in their 20s. Anyway, back to the game discussion. 
When fighting enemies in Jack 2, a problem you're bound to run into as a newcomer is the fact that Jack has no iframes when getting hit, so if you get cornered by a group of enemies, you'll take all that damage with no breathing room. This was true in Jack 1, but I never mentioned it because the lurkers were never the threat that the metalheads are in Jack 2. These guys are faster, have more attacks, are more aggressive, and have more projectiles, and more of them are on the screen. So now, iframes will trip up players more in Jack 2 than the Precursor Legacy. The other major issue with Jack 2's difficulty balancing is the checkpoints. There are several missions that just have no checkpoints at all. The escape from the palace at the end of the game is an example, but there are so many missions you could use as an example, like backing up Sig in the cavern or escorting these three morons to the heart of Mar Gem. If you die, it's all the way back to the beginning of the mission. I don't think Jack 2 asks a lot of its players in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, but when the consequences of failure mean a boatload of progress is lost, it just feels really punishing. But then, the game is very inconsistent with this too. Some missions do have generous checkpoints throughout the game, but others simply have none. It just throws the balance of the game out of whack. You can't tell if the designers were trying to make a punishing game or were just slapdash with their checkpoint placements. The lack of iframes and the checkpoints was the biggest thing that tripped me up back in 2011, and I guess I also just thought it was funny to play up the rage because my favorite YouTubers did it and therefore I must copy their personality to the letter. Oh, to be 11 again. Anyway, these two issues are things I will admit to. If you don't like the game on those grounds or have issues with driving for minutes on end and all that, I get it. Nobody has to like the game as much as I do, I just look past those things to enjoy what I enjoy about the game. In fact, in the main platforming missions, I kinda like the harsh checkpoints. It gives the game a real tense vibe when you get to the end of a mission, but you can't get sloppy because a poorly timed jump could mean redoing the whole level. It adds some suspense to the experience, which I'd imagine was something they wanted given the more serious story and intimidating setting. Because of the way the combat is designed, it makes the metalheads a more consistent threat from start to finish. I just talked about how they come in all shapes and sizes throughout the game, and this gives them variety as enemies. But then, they're also interesting villains from an art design and story perspective. When researching the first game, I saw them note in the artwork that they intentionally designed all the human characters with the long ears so that players would associate them instantly as someone on your side. And on the flip side, they designed all the lurker enemies from the basic grunt to the big guy and even the lurker shark to all share a massive underbite, making you instantly recognize that they're the enemy. These are the kinds of details you'd never think of while playing the game, but it has a subconscious effect on you while playing. Jack 2 takes that philosophy and uses it to its advantage. First, they design the metalheads in a similar fashion. Every metalhead has solid yellow eyes and a giant shining skull gem that you collect upon defeating them. But they also wanted these guys to appear more menacing. Naughty Dog noted that no player would ever find the lurkers to be a threat in Jack 1, you just see them and punch them. But in Jack 2, it was all designed to be more challenging, like I've said. In terms of the story, the simple good guys and bad guys art design from Jack 1 is used to show how things have changed in the world. For example, one of your regular threats in this game is the Crimson Guard, but these are all normal humans led by completely normal humans. But the Lurkers are now a permanent underclass that you help escape slavery, coming to befriend a Lurker named Bruder, who even has evolved to walk on two feet. But then again, we're over 40 minutes into the video now, and if you haven't played the game, you don't even know what's going on and what I mean when I say the art design and characters show how the world has changed. So, allow me to fix that. Jack and Daxter find out four missions in that Baron Praxis is secretly giving barrels of eco to metalheads whom he claims he's fighting against. Torn tells Jack and Daxter to go meet Crew, an arms dealer in the city to hopefully get on his good side and then learn why the Baron is doing this. The answer is that the metalheads need eco to live, and since Praxis knows he can't beat the metalheads, he cut a deal with them promising that he'd give them eco in secret, and in exchange, they'll attack the city just enough to warrant Praxis' continued rule. Praxis is an illegitimate leader. The guy who once fought off the metalheads was called Mar. He created Haven City and the shield wall that surrounds it to keep the metalheads from getting in. The true heir to Mara's throne is a kid whose whereabouts are currently unknown. As long as metalheads attack the city, Praxis can continue his unjust rule over Haven City. It turns out that this kid that the underground's taking care of is Mara's heir and they intend to put him back on the throne after they take down Baron Praxis. Jack and Daxter's missions do a lot of good in the underground's cause, rising through the ranks of the group to the point where the Shadow decides it's time to meet them after a mission in Dead Town where they stop the Metalheads from destroying the Sacred Site, a place the Metalheads seem to be drawn to. But for the duo, it's a shocking discovery that the Sacred Site is Samos' hut from the Precursor Legacy and that Dead Town is what's left of Sandover Village where they grew up, revealing that the Rift Ring the characters traveled through took them hundreds of years into the future. But things get scarier when it turns out that the Shadow is a younger version of Samos. The player might have been able to guess that they were in the future before this point, but when you see that a 15 years younger version of Samos is leading the underground, now you really want to know how the story is going to play out. As J and D meet up with Kira, who works as a mechanic. 
and still don't know what happened to the old Samos they knew, setting up a lot of intrigue for the second act of the story. Now, while all this serious stuff is going on around Jack and Daxter, I still think Jack 2 is a funny game. Barring the humor that was obviously included to appeal to 13-year-old boys, I think that Jack 2, in terms of comedic value, is actually funnier than Jack 1. And like Jack 1, the humor value comes from Daxter. In the first game, the humor was largely Daxter being snarky and rude to the various people you met during the game. But it's no doubt that the funniest scenes in the Precursor Legacy were the ones that made Daxter the butt of the joke, which is why Samos was my favorite character in the game, as he'd roast Daxter every chance he got. But now, a lot more characters are doing that, and it's just very entertaining. Hey! Tattooed Wonder! How come we get all the crappy missions? Because I... don't... like... you. Fair enough. Even when other characters aren't involved, Daxter is consistently taking punishment in these cutscenes, like he's got some universal bad luck. Hello, me! Even when he tries turning the tables on Jack, he still gets the short end of the stick. Wait a minute! I think this time you should go get the thing. Looks dodgy up there! Don't hurt yourself, Jack! But I don't just enjoy the slapstick comedy of Daxter, I think Jack 2 has great character interactions between the cast. I can say that because Jack 2 has a core cast of characters. Jack 1's gameplay-focused structure meant that all the people you saw in the world were just one-offs that gave you a power cell. Here you regularly interact with and take missions from the same people, and so they give each one a personality and a different motivation for being in the story. They also designed missions that affected the world you were playing in, continuing off of the Precursor Legacy contextualizing everything you do. But back to the characters, I just love the cast in this game. Like Sig, he's a total powerhouse that works for crew, but he's growing more uncomfortable with the kinds of jobs he has to do each day. So he starts off all tough, but he starts to like Jack and Daxter the more the game goes on. Or Torn, who used to be the lead of the Crimson Guard, but quit due to the cruelty displayed by Praxis. One of my favorite new characters is Vin, who's a total nervous wreck who's always fretting over the threat of the Metalheads. And the scenes with him and Daxter are some of my favorites in the game. Now, these plasmite bombs should do the trick. Drop one into each well. <laughs> and the blast will do the rest. Plasmite, huh? Cool. How does it work? Ah! I believe this is yours. Hey, not my problem anymore. <laughs> no, really. I insist. Uh, uh, you're the hero. No, Jack's the hero. Oops. Sorry. My bad. I also love the cutscenes with Onan, a wise old woman in the bazaar who guides you when it comes to old precursor legends. But she can only be understood through her interpreter, Pecker, who's another one of my favorite characters in the game with his shameless snark. Why is Mars' tomb so important? The fabled precursor stone is rumored to sleep within the tomb, stupid! I added the stupid part! Helps that every character is really well cast and equally well directed throughout the scenes. In the 90s, games having acting at all was a bar most companies were happy to meet, but Naughty Dog was always a step above that, as early as Crash 2 getting the talented Clancy Brown to play Dr. Neo Cortex. But fast forward six years and you have Jack 2, where they got a lot of voice talent from the animation and voiceover world to bring their characters to life in their first truly cinematic game, such as Susan Eisenberg as Ashlyn, Phil Lamar as Sig, or Clancy Brown once again as Baron Praxis. I highlighted them specifically because they were on Justice League, which aired on Cartoon Network at the time, so that gets special mention. But everyone here was talented and passionate about the project, and in awe over what Naughty Dog was achieving with this game. Although on the subject of Baron Praxis, I find him to be a pretty interesting character. We see several sides of him throughout the game. First is the guy we want revenge against for what he did to Jack, then as the ruthless dictator ruling the city. You see this side of him through these propaganda-spewing speakers placed throughout the city where he speaks to the people about how he's protecting them from the metalheads and these other lies. It's fun to stop and listen to these when you actively follow the story. You know he's trading eco with the metalheads, but here he is getting on the mic talking about how he's bravely putting a stop to their continued assault on the city. This is your Baron. I am still in control. And I assure you, there's absolutely no metalheads in the city. Anyone who contradicts this fact will be shot. The current situation is merely an elaborate propaganda hoax perpetrated by the outlawed underground militia trying to subvert our laws and discredit those who protect you while you sleep. Pay no attention to this foolish hoax. There are no metalheads within a hundred miles of this city. But things get complex when you learn that he's not trading Eco with the metalheads to help them. He wants to destroy them, he just doesn't have the power to do it. When talking to Errol, he says this. He's toying with us! 
Let me lead an assault on the nest before it's too late! I can take him! Patience, Commander. No one has ever penetrated the Metalhead Nest, you know that. I've seen what comes of such foolish plans. Then when you reach the nest, you see it's covered in destroyed tanks and all that. Meaning he did lead a direct attack on the nest and got beat really badly, and now he's been searching for a more powerful way to destroy them ever since, including the Dark Warrior program they tried on Jack. But that doesn't make him sympathetic. He's a terrible person doing evil things, selling lies to his adoring fans while also having nothing but contempt for them. However, it just so happens that your goals align with his in trying to stop the Metalheads, which is a core part of the second act, the race for the Precursor Stone. The Metalheads are the ancient enemy of the Precursors, and the Metalhead leader feeds on the Precursor life energy that can be released from the Precursor Stones. Mar used Haven City and the Shield Wall to safeguard the last Precursor Stone from the Metalheads, but now, nobody knows where the stone is. Jack and Daxter find it in the center of the city underneath the giant Mar statue. Funny how no one thought to look there. This is Mar's tomb, as you get there with young Samos, Kor, and the kid who opens the door to the tomb as he's Mar's heir. But since he's too young to face the trials inside, Jack rushes in, beginning one of my favorite levels, Mar's tomb, where you have to navigate through tough platforming, as well as tests of memory and reflexes. But then, in a twist, Praxis swipes the Precursor Stone from under you and tosses all your allies in jail. This is a cool moment for the story because we see different character motivations colliding and causing conflict. It turns out that Praxis knew they were about to make a move on the stone because Torn told him. Praxis threatened to kill Ashlyn, his own daughter, who Torn has affection for. Something the story set up as a sore subject earlier on. Why didn't you tell me Ashlyn was Praxis' daughter? What's your connection with her? That's none of your business. So he put that before the cause of the underground. He is quickly forgiven as you must lead a daring rescue mission inside the fortress you escaped from at the beginning of the game, but getting out was much easier than getting back in as the guards have new armor that allows them to take more damage and you have to carefully use the jet board to grind through these laser cannons and electricity waves. It's an intense mission I always look forward to when playing the game. Once you rescue your teammates, you also find the older Samos trapped in the prison as well, as the two versions of Samos bicker back and forth like it's nobody's business. We need to find the kid pronto! What are you talking about, old growth? The kid already opened the tomb. Our top priority should be to disrupt the Baron's forces. Oh, look who thinks they've sprouted. If you were half as wise as I am, you'd know that the proper course of action is to find the kid. It then becomes an element of the story that Jack, Daxter, and the old Samos help the young Samos grow to get the sagely powers you know he's supposed to have after having played the first game. And then, Kira reveals to the old Samos alongside Jack and Daxter that she's rebuilt the Rift Rider they went through at the beginning, but is missing the Heart of Mar Gem and a device called the Time Map, which are in Crew's hands. But he's currently working with Praxis to use the Precursor Stone to build a bomb capable of destroying the Metalheads that will also destroy the entire world in the process. So the third act is a quest to stop the stone from being used to create that bomb, with nobody knowing that all their efforts are in service of the true villain's machinations. Kor, what's going on? I'm sure you know. Deep down in your darkest nightmares. We've met before, remember? Everything's going exactly as planned. At the 11th hour, it's revealed that Kor was the Metalhead leader all along, disguised as a human to get into the city, join the underground, and help them undermine Praxis. Right before the reveal, the city goes on high alert as Metalheads are attacking. A lot of things went into this happening, so I shall explain, as the reveal of Korra's true identity allows players to recontextualize the story. Praxis thought he was playing the long game, deal with the Metalheads, give them eco and strike when they least expect it, but Korra was playing an even longer game. He would take the Baron's eco and apply the pressure by saying he's at his wit's end with the slow eco deliveries. Meanwhile, he'd receive intel on Praxis by being a member of the Underground, like this part here. And we overheard a secret meeting with the leader of the Metalheads! You saw the Metalhead leader? No, he was on some communicator. But we heard him talking with Baron Praxis. The Baron is bribing the Metalheads with Eco! <laughs> it will never be enough. But the Baron's gonna double-cross him! Is that so? And like I said, by being a part of the Underground, he can further undermine Praxis. Positioning himself to be there when major events happen, like reaching Mars Tomb. While in the city, he learned how to shut down the shield wall, but needed the perfect moment to strike. Enter Crew. Crew worked alongside the Baron to develop the bomb that would destroy the Metalheads with the Precursor Stone, but he made a side deal with Kor to provide the Metalhead armies a way into the city that would go unnoticed, which happened at the end of the game as Sig claims he was sent into the Underport by Crew to open an old gateway, and once he did, Metalheads began their attack. 
In the attack on the city, the situation's given more stakes because Vin, one of my favorite characters in the game, gets killed off by an army of metalheads at the power station. With the shield wall down and the metalheads in the city, it's only a matter of time until Kor finds the Precursor Stone. And after being beaten by Metal Core, Praxis reveals to Jack that the stone was placed inside of a backup bomb before dying. He also mentions that he made Jack the way he is now with the intent for Jack to defeat the Metalheads. Showing how even in his final moments, Praxis is thinking that if Jack uses the stone to defeat Core, Praxis wins, technically. An ego to the very last. But that sets up the final mission where Jack and Daxter have to raid the Metalhead Nest. Precursor stone, gun, nest. Light her up, Padre! <laughs> I eat this! That ought to wake him up. Let's go take care of business. What? You mean go in there? Uh, I'm right behind you. Maybe it's just experience at this point, but I feel like the final level isn't really that spectacular. Gaul and Maya's Citadel was the ultimate test of all the platforming skills you had gained up to that point in Jack 1, but here it's just some enemies blocking your path that you tear through before reaching Kor, who has the kid as a hostage. The final part of his plan is to get the stone from Jack and Daxter and then have the kid open it, because the kid is Jack's younger self. Jack was born in the future with all these precursor eco powers, but was sent to the past in the hopes he'd gain the skills to face Kor when he was older. But with Jack having been experimented on with Dark Eco, he can't access the precursor life force inside the stone like his younger self can. So now it's just an intense final boss between Jack and Kor where it's set up so that you start the battle as Dark Jack, but the second I transformed into him, I was immediately turned back to normal. I feel like that happens every time I get to this boss fight. But even without Dark Jack, I'd say Metal Core is pretty easy to defeat. You just gotta roll jump out of the way of his attacks and attack after he's done. And once you do, the day is saved. The Rift Ring is open and Kira's Rift Rider is ready. But Old Samos claims that they need to use it to send Young Jack and Young Samos back to the past so that Young Jack can grow up in a safer world. This turning the series into a time loop where the young Jack will always be rescued from Kor by his older self and then sent back in time with a younger Samos where Jack grows up, the events of Jack 1 happen, and that causes this Jack to be sent into the future where he experiences the events of Jack 2 and then the cycle begins all over again. Although, the game quickly shows how confusing time travel can get. I sure hope I built this replica right. I don't know if it- It's perfect, Kira. This is the very machine we found, or will find later. What? I just built this, after seeing the first one I need. It's based on what I remember from the- Honey, the more you think about it, the more it hurts the head. But on that note, the weirdest thing about this whole twist is something pretty minute. Jack had this uncle character in Jack 1, to the point where there was a quote from the uncle in the manual of Jack 1, not Samos, because they obviously hadn't thought this far ahead. That's just one of those things that you have to sweep under the rug to enjoy the overall story. Forget that guy ever existed, basically. And that's basically it for the story of Jack 2. With all the major villains of the game dead, the heroes celebrate, remember those whose lives are lost, and look towards the future where they rebuild Haven City. Jack, my boy, a future awaits. And after having written 11,000 words on Jack 2, I'm thinking that my point in all this might have been lost in the sauce long ago. So now that we're in the conclusion, I'll address the title of the video. Do I think Jack 2 is a perfect game? No, I guess not. I can list several flaws with it I've not mentioned thus far in the video. Like how I think it's weird how the story tells us that Jack is a symbol of hope for the people of the city, but then it's a core gameplay mechanic to steal from, bump into, and attack the citizens. I try not to hurt anyone when I play this game since that's just not my style, but to get around, you have to steal vehicles on the regular. Kind of a weird mismatch between the story and the gameplay. I never look forward to these missions with this clunky mech suit that come at the end of the game. I think these rail shooting segments are all boring, and I think things start getting padded when you have to rescue lurkers for a second time at the end of the game, but none of that really matters to me. Jack 2 is not perfect by any means, but for me, it comes together like no other game. It's such a satisfying mix of different elements that all work in isolation and putting them together in a fun way. It's unorthodox for sure. You probably won't like it if you're an adult playing it for the first time, but when it clicks, it really clicks. It's without question one of my favorite games to ever be made. I specifically called it a misunderstood masterpiece because, well, I obviously think that its writing and world design and gameplay are masterful, but then I just see this game written off as a dated product of its time so often, made by a studio desperate to be one of the big kids but too afraid to just let go of their cartoony roots. When I just don't see that in Jack 2, I see a careful, all-in effort to make a next-generation game that, like its predecessor and the Crash games before it, sought to raise the bar on storytelling, voice acting, and animation in games, with cutting-edge world design, 
It's something I appreciate about Naughty Dog as a studio from 1996 all the way to today. And Jack 2 is no different. And that's basically all I gotta say on this one. I really did just say everything I ever could about this game in the last, like, hour, so I'm glad I got the chance to give this game a full review that I can be proud of, to say the least. Having said that, next week is Jack 3, and I'll be honest, I'm not as much of a fan of that one as I am Jack's 1 and 2. So join me next week to hear all about it. Until then, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.